Great. Well, I want to make the most of everyone's time, and I've explained to um, our, our guest speakers today how the, the campfire conversations work, that we tend to get uh, a small but, but a very, really important audience um, in the live session, and then the majority will check it out later on. The, the key part is, is the content that we're going to learn about today is really, really important. And, um, you know, I, I'm guessing that you, you're aware of that to some degree that um, you're not immune from it in your neighborhood and your church community and definitely not in <clears throat> your member camps or if you're from a camp. Uh, the, the sad reality uh, we'll learn detail about of human trafficking and human slavery, slavery is uh, it's just a, a, a horrific thing throughout the world. And um, as I introduce our speakers today, I just want to say this about the organization that they're representing, uh, A21. It exists uh, for, for healing, uh, to reach, rescue, and restore, to break people out of the, the cycle of, of human slavery and trafficking. And when I thought about those words, reach, rescue, and restore, that really fits Christian camping. We're, we're going about it um, in a unique way through creating temporary community, fun activities, um, friendships and the sharing of the gospel. And uh, there's so many of those components that find them more, their way into what A21 is doing, but different. I mean, they're really, really on the front lines. And the, the beauty of camp is that it's a place of, of healing and it's a safe place, that's for sure. So when I was first approached as a camp leader years ago about getting more involved in helping in our area, I have to be honest, I just was really unaware of the impact. In fact, the person who was reaching out to me, uh, she learned about it in her church in Sacramento, which is the capital of the state of California. And she had no idea that Sacramento was part of a triangle between Las Vegas, Nevada and Los Angeles, California. And they were just pulling people in from those cities and shipping them around in that triangle. Um, and so this woman was telling me these, these are particularly um, young people. Um, in her context, it was mostly teens and mostly young women, uh, vulnerable young women getting pulled into this cycle and they can't get out of it. And so she was uh, deeply moved and, and angry as she should be. And brought it up with the Lord and just said, you know, you need to do something about this. And the reply to her heart from the spirit was, yes, what are you going to do? I'll be there with you. Um, let's get moving. And so what I love about that story is she'll tell you, she had no resources, no background whatsoever, just a desire to, to help. And as she moved forward, just God provided connections and resources. And then she started to have a new set of eyes to, to know what to look for. Because, you know, I can speak for myself, I'm probably walking right past it all the time in Santa Cruz, California here, and not picking up on what's going on. So I'm really, really grateful that Kim Thompson is here, and she's brought along some co-workers, Kaylee and Steph, she'll introduce in a second. But I got to meet um, Kim recently on a totally different subject, and um, I found out about her camping background, uh, serving many years at, at, at Camp Choye in uh in the United States and with Young Life Ministries. So she gets camping and, and loves it and is passionate about it. But God has called her uh, to be on the front lines of just eradic eradicating slavery in this world. And um, just so, so grateful, Kim, for what you're bringing uh, today. And as you mentioned earlier in our pre-call, some experts with you. And so I, I just wanna thank you, Kaylee and Steph, for being a part of this. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kim. And I'll, um, I'll wrap this up at the end, but um, yeah, lead us on in this important discussion. Thanks guys, um, I'm traveling. So I'm actually in a restaurant. So if you have trouble hearing me, please let me know and I will try to do something about that. But um, as you can see, um, A21, um, A21's mission is to abolish slavery everywhere forever. Um, slavery still exists today and we call it human trafficking. Um, I was first exposed to human trafficking long before I'd ever heard the term. So I was a camp, uh, I was a counselor, not counselor. Well, I was a counselor. I was a counselor at a, at a camp during college, moved on afterwards. And my husband and I ran a Christian camp. So I was involved with Christian Camping International 
for about 22 years. But one Thursday afternoon, the counselor came into my office and she said, I have a camper I need you to talk to. And I said, um, have we gone through the chain of command? And she said, no, ma'am, we have not. I think she needs to talk to you. And, you know, and sometimes you get that gut feeling that you need to listen to the person that's bringing the situation to you. And I said, okay, if you feel like she needs to come straight to me, that's fine. And she did. Um, and the young lady was about 12 years old. She came into my office and she sat in a chair and she sobbed for two hours. Um, and regardless of what I tried to do to console her, I just, I just couldn't. And so I sat with her and I held her hand and I said, I'm here to listen to your story. And when you're ready to talk, you tell me. And finally, after that two hour period of just uncontrollable sobbing, she told me that her dad was raping her and selling her to other men in the apartment complex where they lived. Now, I'm a camp director. I, I'm not equipped with this, um, but I did all the things that I knew to do. I, I called CPS, which here in the state is our child protective services who kind of followed all the protocol um, that we have here in order to get other people involved and to come to her safety. And to be honest with you, the system failed in every possible way. And so on Saturday morning, even though I had been told on Thursday afternoon that the dad would not be there to pick her up for camp, her dad walked in the gate. And I had to make a decision. What was I going to do? Um, if I left with the child, I was kidnapping her. If I let her go home with the dad, I had great fear of what was going to happen and the things that might take place in her life. Um, I got the sheriff's department involved and they said, if she will tell you that she does not want to go, then she doesn't have to and I can intervene. But if she doesn't tell you that, I can't do anything. Um, I was furious with them. I was furious with the system. I was, I, I literally wanted to harm the father. Um, I was just outraged at the whole situation. And as you'll learn in a little while, some of the things that victims of trafficking or trafficking go through, the little girl could not tell me that she didn't want to go. She was terrified. And even as I stood between her and her father, and I said, all you have to do is tell me that you don't want to go and I can protect you. That wasn't enough. She didn't believe that that could really happen. And so I had to let her walk out the gates of came up with her dad that afternoon. Now, the police did come through. We got the FBI involved. And by Wednesday of that week, she was out of that situation. But like you know, she's a minor. I'm just a camp director. I have no relationship. I don't know what happened to that child after that point. I just know that she was removed from the situation and the father was arrested as were the people that were also purchasing um, sex from the dad um, and, the, and the child that he was exploiting. But it led me down a path that I became um, 20 something years ago exposed to, but later as life took me into different situations and different scenarios, I really became passionate about the work uh, in the anti-trafficking space. So through my camp experience, moving on to Young Life, as Bill mentioned, and then spending um, seven and a half years with Fuller Theological Seminary and having an opportunity to be exposed further to issues around social injustice, I became very passionate about the topic of human trafficking and what could be done in it. So whenever I was um, had an opportunity to join the A21 team, and you will find out in just a minute when you meet Steph and Kaylee, just the amazing, amazing work that this organization is doing and the professionals with which um, they are bringing to the table to fight this horrific crime. I think you'll be as impressed as I am. Steph Jones, um, Steph, will you wave your, your uh, name's not up there? Steph is our global prevention specialist. She's also an attorney. Um, and um, as she describes moonlights occasionally with our legal team, uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, she's gonna bring to you all the material that we use in our prevention work at age 21. Um, and on the other end of my screen, I don't know where she is on yours, um, we have uh, Kaylee McLean, and Kaylee is our global awareness specialist. Um, and so she really focuses on our work around awareness um, across the globe and what we're doing in this space. So I'm excited that they'll be joining me today. We will be going pretty deep into our work. So we're going to take the next hour to just walk through some things. We're going to show some videos. We hope at the end of this, you're going to leave with not only a better understanding of what human trafficking is, but you're also going to have um, the resources that you need to implement things into the camp setting, whether it's, um, and, and I'm going to tell you this now so you can be thinking about it, whether it's how you inform your parents, how you train your staff, how you look for issues that could be relative to um, your summer staff themselves, if they're in a place that maybe their intentions are not good um, in the camping world, uh, and we know that exists from time to time. 
or you're, you're just bringing digital safety materials and bringing awareness to the problem so that you yourself can look for it in, in campers and the lives that they have and how they come to camp. And when they're vulnerable, we know that in the relationships that we build in the camp space, people become, uh, they become more willing to step in to engage with their counselors that they become close to over this time. And then how do we respond to that? So we're, we're gonna get started and talk a little bit more um, just about what the anti-trafficking space looks like. So who is A21? A21 is a global anti-trafficking nonprofit organization founded on the radical hope that we can end modern day slavery everywhere forever. Um, and we do believe that this is a possibility. Otherwise we would not have dedicated our lives to serving in this way. A21 was started in 2007 by Nick and Christine Kane. Um, they saw posters of missing women and children uh, with only the word missing stamped across every poster. Um, they were in the airport when they saw this and they came across um, a poster with the little girl's name, uh, Sophia. And at the same time uh, that they saw this poster, they also had a little girl by the name of Sophia who was about the age of this child. Um, and that they, they learned at that point that there were many missing people who were potential victims of human trafficking. Nick and Christine knew that they had to do something, so they reached out to various contacts to see what was being done in the fight against trafficking already. And after hearing countless stories of the hopelessness from the many organizations that, um, that they, of the hopelessness in the organizations they were facing, they just decided to start A21. And in 2008, A21 um, built its first office and established our home in Thessaloniki, Greece. Its first 10 years consisted of hopeless, I'm sorry, let me get back to my name, I just lost it, sorry. The first 10 years consisted of opening offices and freedom centers, which is part of our aftercare service in Ukraine, California, Bulgaria, North Carolina, London, South Africa, Norway, Thailand, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Spain. Um, with major court case victories, hotlines launched, campaigns launched, and various awards, A21 had only just begun. So as you can see, A21 is only about 15 years old. So we have um, offices and freedom centers and child advocacy centers around the world. Um, in Depending on which country we're in and the operational focus will depend on what we have. In Thailand and Cambodia, we have child advocacy centers because there's a huge need for um, uh, addressing the issue of trafficking with children. There's um, a lot of children who are trafficked in Southeast Asia, as there are all across the world. Um, and a child advocacy center is a safe place for children to come after they've been victimized uh, in, a, in a safe and child-friendly environment where, where it's, it's designed to reduce um, re-victimization. So ordinarily where a child may have been asked by you know, a parent, a police officer, a social worker, the next police officer, a hospital staff, over and over and over again, tell me what happened. You know, ex explain to me the rape or the abuse or the violence over and over and over again, re-traumatizing the child. Uh, by the time you get a child to court, you know, there's either no emotion, they're just used to telling the same story, maybe people don't even believe at that point or they've been coached to the point where evidence isn't admissible. And so part of the model of the Child Advocacy Center is essentially to have a safe place where children are asked one time uh, by someone who's been forensically trained to interview children. Um, and so we we run these offices in Thailand and in Cambodia. Uh, they're run with, in partnership with the police, with local law enforcement, multidisciplinary teams or MDT teams. So you might have um, healthcare workers, government, shelters, if the nation requires children who have been victims to go through government shelter in the process of being rehomed. Um, so we do those, um, we run those centers in Southeast Asia. Uh, other areas of the world and other countries, we have freedom centers. So we've moved away from the model of, um, uh, from that model of homes and shelters to how can we encourage people in independent living and how can we build them up for longevity and sustainable um, and yeah, sustainable um, 
and holistic healing in the process. So a freedom center is essentially a hub that's kind of central in a community. Um, we have them in Texas and North Carolina in the US. Um, we have it in South Africa. We have in Thailand and, sorry, not Thailand, uh, in Cambodia. We have in um, Southern Greece, we've got in Bulgaria. Um, and so in those areas, uh, um, we have this in there for adults and for children, but primarily adults. And they're a way of survivors to come into the center, get everything they need, whether it's um, physical needs. So we have um, areas where they're able to pick up groceries or clothing or, you know, physically resource them. And I know our teams around um, national holidays might have things for Christmas or things for Thanksgiving if you're in the U.S. or, you know, things so that survivors are able to provide presents and food and meals for their families with dignity. So it's not a gift um, coming from somebody else. They're able to choose and just provide it to their families. They can have um, counseling sessions. The multidisciplinary teams can come and meet from our um, freedom centers. You can have... Um, uh, skills-based training, employment opportunities. Our Freedom Center in South Africa also um, is able to operate uh, like um, employment opportunities from there as well. Um, yeah, and so that's some of the stuff that we're doing around the, the globe. So um, as we were talking about the impact of slavery, there's 49.6 million slaves that are estimated around the world today. Um, it's a $150 billion industry. So unfortunately, in the industry, it, it is a low risk, high reward, especially in areas where laws are not enforced. So um, it makes it uh, an easy target for vulnerable populations. So there are 27.6 million people um, in forced labor and 22 million in forced marriage. Um, of that, we estimate... Um, uh, women are disproportionately, disproportionately affected. 54% of um, all victims are estimated to be women and girls. And roughly one in four human trafficking victims are children. So that means 25% of all the victims we see um, are children. Migrant workers face a much higher risk of forced labor than those that are not um, um, immigrants. And it's estimated that 14% of all adults in forced labor are immigrants. It's also estimated that human trafficking, both sex trafficking and forced labor, generates $150 million in um, illicit profits that we just spoke about a second ago. Um, so slavery happens in every country, whether you know about it or not. Um, and Bill, I was like you, and you talked about just not recognizing that this was a problem. And I just left another group and, and somebody said, I didn't realize this happened here. I said, yeah, it, it happens everywhere. And for us not to recognize it um, is a problem. So we want to talk about um, just diving deeper into the problem of human trafficking and what it looks like. And I think before we do that, we have to understand what human trafficking is. So human trafficking is the illegal trade of human beings. It's the recruitment, control, and the use of people for their bodies and for labor. It takes a lot of different forms. Um, but it's all all involves force, fraud, and coercion. Um, people everywhere are being bought and sold against their will right now in the 21st century. Human trafficking is a hidden, fast-growing and complex crime that literally generates billions of dollars by exploiting millions of men, women, and children. It's often said that human trafficking is hidden, but in plain sight. And of course, the low risk, high reward that I talked about earlier. It's illegal, but not enough is being done to stop it. And there, there are many forms of trafficking, but some of the most common types are the forced labor and the sex, tra sex trafficking, as well as involuntary domestic servitude and online child exploitation. There are other types of trafficking as well that include um, bonded labor and child soldiers. Um, A21 focuses a lot on the forced labor and sex trafficking, which is what we're gonna talk a lot about today, as well as child exploitation and domestic servitude. The forced labor is when someone is forced to work in captivity for little or no pay. 
Um, it does not depend on the type or sector of work, but only whether the work was imposed on a person against their will through coercion. There must be both a lack of free and informed consent and coercion for a job to be considered forced labor. You're a coward, Yuri. You're not my brother. Добре, че искаш да си опиташ късмета, Росине. На добър час и на здраве. На здраве. Мъжлува не си на ви работи с недосъди, брата, че това. Я обовязкува за Витай до те. Hi, Yuri. About this advert you apply for, how about we start you tomorrow? Hi, it's Rosen. We spoke about the summer job in Greece. I really need this job. Thank you, brother. Hi, I'm Rosen, by the way. Yuri. Upward, guys. Upward. You're gonna give us back, right? Of course. Get to work, you filthy animal. Pasta! It's a white hair. I've stopped by it. I took a flyer from inside. There is a phone number. We need to call for help. Call for help? With what phones? Hello, human trafficking hotline. Good. I didn't do anything. The friend. Oh, Uri. Yuri, you saw him. Gone. Sorry. Please, please, where are the flowers? Please, do you have a phone? Hello? 1109 human trafficking hotline. I think my brother is killed. I'm in a village, in a farm, in the border. Yuri, his name is Yuri. Okay, sir, help is on the way. Sex trafficking is when someone is forced to see the course into performing um, commercial sex. Sex trafficking can, can include commercial sex exploitation, sex tourism, pornography, and strip clubs. So we see this happen um, in many different forms in different many ways, but whether it's sex trafficking or forced labor, um, force fraud or coercion is always involved in human trafficking. <laughs> domestic servitude is when a person is forced to work or live in the same place with a little no pay. 
consists of an individual working in a private residence, making inspection by authorities more difficult. Uh, domestic workers are often not given the same basic benefits and protections that are ordinary bestowed that are ordinarily bestowed upon other workers. So we want to show you what this can potentially look like as well. Hey, good morning. We'll be in the other room. This should have been done. If you're like me, these uh, these videos are really hard to watch um, because we work with children when you see that things um, can be possible in their lives and to know that um, their children and adults who are suffering under these conditions is really hard. We have one more to show you. Uh, child sexual exploitation is a form of child abuse in which an adult or adolescent uses a child for sexual uh, stimulation. Forms of child sexual exploitation include, but are not limited to, engaging in sexual activities, um, child sex trafficking, sale of a child, and the online child sexual exploitation. While some forms involve commercial elements to the exploitation, there are also, there are almost always some form of abuse of vulnerability. Perpetrators may use physical, emotional, or sexual abuse as a form of control. So we wanna show you this film, and then we're gonna talk more about how this happens. important for you to know that we don't use any of these films as a means of um, uh, dramatizing the situation of the stories. The films that you've just seen really are stories that have actually happened um, and in the cases that A21 has worked on. So we tell you these because they're real and the things that really happen. And traffickers use different methods to recruit victims, including the false job advertisement like we saw in the labor trafficking of the lover boy a pimp trafficking situation, um, being sold by families, false relationships, promise of a better life, um, and abduction. Across our operational countries, we see all of these methods. And while many pe people think that human trafficking happens only through abduction, people are more often trafficked or recruited by people that they know. Um, so that is a really important fact to think about. Um, here are some of the um, trends that we've seen recently, um, and these are from our survivors specifically. 42.9% of A21 survivors were trafficked through a false job advertising. 12.8% of our survivors were recruited through a lover boy scenario. 11.3% um, were sold by their families, and 87 were trafficked by a friend. So let's look a little bit more into the different recruitment um, methodologies or more in detail. False job advertisements. These are opportunities to use the, the false promise of a job to traffic people who both laborers say. Um, you saw in the, the scenario with the, the young girls, 
Um, they were going somewhere to work, so their their parents were sending them away. And the young man, he was being sent for a job opportunity that he thought was different than what it was. Labor trafficking is one of the most common um, outcomes of trafficking. Some things to keep in mind um, to avoid false job advertisements are being aware of the legal minimum age in your area. This may vary depending on the industry, but ensuring there is an employment contract in place, getting details of any travel arrangements, never giving your identification documents to anyone, notifying your family or friends of any employment travel, knowing your rights and doing your research. Don't be afraid to report a suspicious job advertisement or situation. And we'll talk a little bit later about our hotlines and how they can help with that, but I'll leave that to the experts in just a minute. We also have the lover boy or Romeo traffic trafficker um, that identify people with vulnerabilities. They know exactly how to move them. They take their victims through different phases, knowing um, known as dating, grooming, and then turnout or, or breaking. In the dating phase, the trafficker pretends to be exactly what their victim um, is longing for or desires for them to be. Grooming can begin during the dating phase, but trafficking begins to start pushing boundaries. The turning or breaking point is when the trafficker sells the person for the first time. This is when they know that they that um, uh, they have more control of that individual when this breaking point happens. Um, other recruitment um, methods um, being sold by their family happens in some situations when family or uh, friends or family members um, themselves recruit and sell victims. This might be due to chronic poverty or financial hardship. Um, false relationship relationship can be when someone is recruited through perceived friends um, who befriend them for the sole purpose of exploiting them. It might be the case that someone is a victim has it might be in the case that someone has known the victim for some time and an opportunity the victim is willing to take without a thorough check due to the trust of the friend. So that is certainly, we see that at camp is, as well when we have people tell us things because of a trusted relationship. Um, and so it's the same situation, although the, the friend is not really trusted. The promise of a better life can look like someone being coerced and deceived into a situation of exploitation simply through the promise of a better standard of living or higher pay. The trafficker who may be a, um, a stranger or acquaintance or a family member usually promises the fantasy of a lavish life, a dream job, or an opportunity that seems too good to be true. And what do our parents tell us when it seems too good to be true? It probably is. The victim um, pursued by this luring picture will agree to the opportunity on the basis of this false promise. Um, abduction is often misconceived stereotype that those who are trafficked or abducted or kidnapped. While abduction um, into exploitation by a complete stranger can happen, it is much more likely that a victim will be recruited through deception or coercion and someone that they know or think they know. Indicators. Um, how do we know that people are being trafficked? Um, and how can, we, um, how can we stop it before it starts? Um, we wanna dive a little bit deeper into what these indicators are and things that you can look for. Um, as signs of potential trafficking. If there's control by another person, when an individual is accompanied by a controlling person and the, um, they do not speak or they speak on behalf of that person and the person you're talking to is, is not responding themselves. They're controlled by movement. They're transported to or from work or live or work in the same place and show signs that their movements are being controlled. Substance abuse um, is often an indicator as well. Um, they most use signs of drug use or drug addiction. Um, victims can be forced or coerced into drug use by their trafficker to turn or turn to substance abuse because um, they're trying to cope with their enslavement and the trauma that they've experienced. It's one thing to hear about the indicators and to learn of the recruitment methods, but it's another thing entirely when you feel deeply connected to the issue. Um, everyone at age 21 has a story and there's a reason that they're in the trafficking space and it's because of the way they've been impacted um, that they want to serve in this world. And it may be their own story. It may be the story of someone that they know um, or maybe just a story of, of something that they've heard about. But each one of us at age 21 have a story. Um, Maria was forced, uh, was trafficked for sex for years um, until one day she bravely was able to escape while on the run. 
Um, she was spotted by a woman who had become aware of a human tra of human trafficking through the posters that she had seen. The woman was able to call the hotline and get Maria to safety while the police conducted a raid um, and a rescue. Um, today, Maria is free. And she's free because of her own bravery and the fact that someone else knew what to look for. Um, another story that I wanted to share with you um, is the story of Jenny. She was only 15 when she met her first met her trafficker on social media. After a month, this this cute, slightly older guy began showing interest and said he wanted to keep dating and buying her gifts. Um, but she had to do something for him. That was the first time he asked her to have sex with a man for money. Now Jenny is free and spreading awareness so more people like her and the situation that she was in can be spared from trafficking. Hopefully these stories help you feel more connected to the issue of human trafficking as well. Um, A21 exists to disrupt the cycle of vulnerability, exploitation, and victimization with proven solutions around the world. Everyone is born with the right to be free, but not everyone gets that opportunity. Introducing the global crime of contradictions, human trafficking. It's low in risk, but high in profit. It's hidden, but in plain sight. It's illegal, but often overlooked. Now, more than ever, millions of people are being exploited for their bodies and labor. But how is this happening? Well, what does every victim of human trafficking have in common? Vulnerability. Some are born into it, caught up in poverty, living as a minority, or dealing with the pressure to provide for their family. Others run into it, fleeing brokenness and abuse. And still, others are found in the middle of it, faced with conflict, natural disasters, or war zones. Victims of slavery are often just human beings who are searching for something better. A better job, a better relationship, a better education, a better life. This is where traffickers strike, turning human expectation into exploitation through force, fraud, or coercion. Months or years can pass. Forced to beg for money on the streets of Bangkok, cook food in a London household, stitch clothes in a Mumbai factory, build buildings in Barcelona, or trafficked for sex across dozens of American cities. Tragically, few victims bravely escape or find rescue. For those who do, the experience of exploitation amplifies unresolved vulnerability, and without intervention, victims can become victims over and over again. Vulnerability, vulnerability. exploitation, exploitation. re-victimization, exploitation, re-victimization, exploitation, re-victimization. Re do you see it? Human trafficking is a cycle. A21 is driven by a radical hope that the cycle can be broken. Over the years, we've seen firsthand that real and lasting change is possible through our model of reach, rescue, and restore. We reach people by equipping them to understand human trafficking through education curriculum, prevention materials, and awareness campaigns. When people know their rights, they can make safe decisions. When people know what signs to look for, they can avoid traps and report suspicions. And by exposing the factors that make people vulnerable, we are able to stop the cycle before it goes any further, and in some cases, before it even begins. Our rescue strategy works with governments and local authorities to secure the freedom of victims and the conviction of traffickers through hotlines, child advocacy centers, professional training, and legal support. When professionals are trained to spot indicators, more victims can be identified. When survivors are represented, traffickers can be brought to justice, preventing them from exploiting others. Our Restore teams are wholeheartedly committed to restoration and independence. We empower survivors through holistic aftercare, safe accommodation, and relocation services. When survivors receive holistic care, they can begin the journey of restoration. And when provided with access to services, they can step into new opportunities. With the right support and healing, a survivor's journey will lead them away from the risk of re-victimization and into the life they've always wanted. Do you see it? 
all over the world, the cycle is breaking. And one life at a time, this is how we end slavery. We know how to stop the cycle of trafficking. And with your help, we will. So all human trafficking is a devastating um, crime, devastating to lots of people. And we know that vulnerable people are, are um, incredibly susceptible to this crime. And we know that the exploitation of that leads to further revictimization. And, and in the video, we just kind of outlined what those vulnerabilities are. We outlined um, the different uh, the different phases and cycles. I think the the end of the video is what's most important. And there is a radical hope that this problem can be solved. And for the sake of time, I'm going to jump jump to Steph, who's going to share the next part of our presentation with you, because I want to make sure that we give you all the resources that you need to effectively impact the work that you're doing in the camping space, and that we have an opportunity to answer any questions at the end. Um, but I think the, the next most important thing is for us to talk about um, what our solution is and how we um, do that through Reach, Rescue, and Restore and the things that are available to them. Um, to actually make a difference in, what the, in the work that they're doing in this space. Thank you, Kim. And uh, Kim's right. You know, we can sometimes be overwhelmed by the, um, the issue itself and the magnitude of the issue and, you know, all of the, I guess, the problems. Um, but the reality is there we can, we can do things about it. Um, and so... Yeah, I just want to talk through a little bit of our solution and then myself and Kaylee are going to kind of tag team on physically what we do and what you can do as a camp, uh, as different campsites around the world. But our solution, so we talk about vulnerability, exploitation, re-victimization. There is a cycle of trafficking. It is similar to cycle of violence, cycle of poverty. When there is no break and way to get out of it, you see people re-victimized over and over and over and over again. And our our job at A21 is to try and intervene at all these different levels. Um, and we can't do this by ourselves. Uh, the solution is far beyond A21 and what we can do. And so it's passionate people like yourselves um, and all the teams that work with you around the world who are able to step into the gaps that we're not able to be in. Um, and I know it was mentioned right at the beginning that there are passionate camp leaders that just are looking for resources. Um, and we're an organization that want to give free resources to passionate people to be able to run and really just impact the community that you're um, in. And one of the greatest things that we talk about is that we are not the experts in the communities that you live in, in the camps that you're running, in your family, in your workplace you know, you are the experts, you are the the key person in those communities that can really leverage relationships that can build on um, trust and rapport. And it, when it comes to breaking this cycle of um, re-victimization, it's trust, it's rapport, it's relationship, particularly when we're working with children, that, is, that gives children that safe space to go and report and talk to an adult. And so if you're spending a lot of time with children in these camp settings who might have a broken home, an unsafe home, maybe parents who are absent or grandparents or neighbors who are absent, maybe they're living out this abuse, this is where we're able to get in and, and, and help. And so we have REACH, which is the educating and equipping everyone to understand um, how you can identify risks, how you can report risks, how you can interact in your community. When we have rescue, uh, what we're talking about is partnering with authorities. Um, and this goes for you guys in camps too. Again, we we want to defer to experts. So when it comes to arresting a baddie or going after someone who we know have committed a crime, that's that's not us. We work with local authorities and police and law enforcement and um, lawyers and judges to to work on with them to get um, justice for for victims uh, through legal programs, and then restore obviously is empowering survivors, um, people that have come through, they've been vulnerable, they've been exploited. Now they're um, able to work with us in our different programs, whether it's children in the child advocacy center, to adults in the freedom centers. It's how can we help with employment and putting them on this journey of restoration, whether it's going um, helping them go to school get a tertiary education, get a trade, 
be um, supported in microloans or equipping them in whatever it is that they want to do to be independent, helping them through um, living in accommodation. Um, so we go through all of this. And as Kim said, for sake of time, I won't go into um, all of these uh, these slides um, now, but uh, Kaylee and I are going to talk to the different programs that you're able to, to take on and run in your camps. Um, one stat I will say is that when it comes to our reach, so the prevention, awareness, and education, we're able to reach millions of kids, hundreds of thousands of kids through and, and adults through our face-to-face -face programs, which I think is very powerful. And so just for the next short while, and um, we obviously, if you have questions, would love to answer and see how we can equip um, as we go. But we just want to talk about some of the practical tools, how they came about and what they actually do um, and how they can be used in your context. So here we have the Early Childhood Prevention Program. Something that's amazing about our resources is that they've all grown out of a need and they've not grown out of a need necessarily in the US or Australia or where the, the author of these programs are. They're growing out of a need in the communities where our teams work. So the Early Childhood Prevention Program uh, grew out of a need from our South Africa team and it is specifically for children ages three to six. And, you know, when we talk about human trafficking and we talk about exploitation and online exploitation or any kind of crime, and we talk about the preventative side of things, I know we always get pushback on whether it is age appropriate to have this conversation with children at three. I mean, the answer is probably no, I wouldn't be talking about child sexual exploitation with a three-year-old. However, it is very important that we talk to them about safe and unsafe secrets and um, safe and unsafe touch, healthy body boundaries. Uh, you know, these are things that we can actually, they're different topics that all impact the the work of human trafficking and exploitation and when it comes to the preventative and awareness side, but it's in child-friendly and child-appropriate language. And so this program, and so if you run any camps with the younger kids, this program, um, it's three sessions in it, six parts, but it is designed to be um, child-centered. It's designed to be activity-based. It is play-based. So let's play, let's do activities, let's color, let's use song, let's use actions to figure out, um, to help equip children to protect themselves. And as I said, it grew out of a need in South Africa where um, in a community that our teams work, the kindergarten teachers, so the, uh, you know, the early childhood centers reached out to our team and essentially said, look, we're seeing children um, being abused in our community. We're seeing children being trafficked, but they don't have the words to explain what is going on. They don't have the words to, uh, and some of them didn't have the education to understand that it's, you know, it's my body and you can't touch it um, because it might be a safe person in their mind. And so we also talk about trusted adults and tricky people just going beyond stranger danger, but who is tricky? What actions um, as a person doing that could make them safe or could make them tricky? What is invited touch and what's uninvited touch? And we talk through, you know, a hug from mum might be something that's invited. It makes you feel happy and warm and, you know, you want it when you're comforted. But maybe there is sometimes a hug from somebody else that is uninvited. You you don't want them to hug you. You tell them no. And so we talk through these concepts. Again, it's at an age appropriate level, but we're teaching children to put words to uh, sexual abuse and, and unwanted touch. We're also talking to them about safe and unsafe secrets. So if, um, and what should be safe and safe would be something bringing you joy, like, uh, well, let's not tell mom about the birthday cake that we've got for her birthday. We want it to be a surprise. A safe secret is short. It's something that it'll be revealed at one point and it's going to make people happy. Whereas an unsafe secret, you know, it's not usually revealed. Someone tells you, like, don't tell anyone. It's our little secret. And so we explain these concepts to children, too. And this can help address things like online um, child sexual exploitation. If someone's taking images of children at this particular age and say, Shh, this is our little secret, let's not tell anyone, we explain to the kids, like, 
if this makes you feel uncomfortable, if you're being harmed, anything like that won't ever be a safe secret. If someone's telling you to keep a secret or lie to someone who's a trusted adult, whether it's a parent, grandparent, friend, um, even the police, then that's not a safe secret as well. And so I hope you can understand in in when we're talking about the early childhood levels, we're actually being a, we're giving children the tools to equip themselves uh, in language that is something that they can identify with. Um, when we go for the primary prevention program, what we do is we step it up to that primary school level, that elementary school level from children's age is six to 12. What's so great about this program is it grew out of a need as well from our Thailand office. Um, originally before this program was written, a lot of programs targeted high school and university students and adults when it came to human trafficking. Be, uh, you know, under 13 years old, a lot of people said this is not appropriate to have this conversation. Um, again, it may not have been appropriate to have a very, very adult conversation about human trafficking and exploitation with six to 12 year olds. But the concept of safety and values and child rights and protecting your young voice and the right to say no is very much essential and needed and age appropriate for six to 12 year olds. So um, our, when our Thailand of, uh, office opened, we realized that uh, the majority of children coming into our care as victims of human trafficking were under the age of the prevention awareness programs, not just from A21, but across the, um, across the nation and globally that were targeting the issue. And so, you know, when you have a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old who are already victims of um, human trafficking and online exploitation, you can't come in at 13 and start teaching prevention. You know, you've missed this gap. And so we noticed it as a gap and we started to write this and pilot it with thousands and thousands of children. I think the initial pilot was more than 7,000 children. Um, and the idea was to help children champion their young voice. And so in this, again, we build like a building block. We start with human rights, child rights, and values. Our uh, belief at A21 is when children and adults don't understand their value and they don't understand their worth and they don't understand that they have rights, then you can exploit this. So if you always think your worth is zero, is nothing, you have been raised in a family or a community that have told you you are worthless and you have no value over and over and over and over again, when someone comes along to uh, ex exploit you, you know, you think, okay, well, or even just give you a tiny little bit of money, still exploiting, but it's a little bit more than nothing. You know, that's where your worth has been set. So we believe it's really important to start talking to children early on about their value and their rights and that they have rights. And similar to the early childhood prevention program, where children are talking, we're talking about safe and unsafe secrets and my personal bodies, and you have the right to say no. We, we build on this in the primary prevention. So if you're working with primary school age children and elementary age children, this is a really powerful tool as well, um, where we're, it's, again, it's play-based, it's age appropriate. We, um, we want to move away from rote learning. So repeat after me, this is trafficking. Don't do this. Don't do that. What we do is we pose little scenarios to the children. We do interactive games and activities, and we ask them, what do you think? What would you do? We have activities in the um, in this program that's a what would you do activity. So if you were in this situation or a family member was in this situation, what would you do? What should they do? And we're getting children to actually use their own um, use their own brains, use their own thoughts, critically analyze some of these situations because the reality is many of them may end up in this situation at some point in their life. And if that happens, we want them to have the knowledge and the courage and um, the confidence in their own voice to be able to speak up and ask for help. And so we want to instill this in the programs that we're doing. Um, as you can see on the slide, we also, we, we did, um, we're actually in the second phase of a longitudinal study right now, and we published the first part in the Journal of Human Trafficking. And what we're doing is we're trying to um, bring in the overlap between public health and a public health approach to human trafficking and trafficking prevention 
and then the voices of education. So why is it essential for people that work with children in whatever setting, including summer camps, why is it essential to equip um, people who are working with children with these tools? And part of it, and I'm sure you you know it, particularly if you're working in um, summer camps that are, you know, you have children for a week or two weeks or even longer, you know that you might be the only person um, of positive influence in that child's life. Um, and so when you're able to tell them, look, I, you know, if something is happening in your world, you can tell me, you can tell one of the camp counselors, we believe you have value. We believe you have um, rights. We want to protect these rights. If anything is happening to you, we want to take this to the police. We want to take this to the authorities. We want to get you help. We're here to help. Um, and sometimes the children don't have this at home. And what we're seeing is we're seeing children self-identify. And that is something that will be huge um, in, in in summer camps too, if you're running these programs, to expect children will come up and say, yeah, this is me. I was um, you know, forced to take pictures or there's more of a um, epidemic right now of um, online sexual exploitation and peer-to-peer -peer generated um, abuse, which is essentially sexting. And then, you know, you break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend or your partner and you've had an inappropriate image or a naked image that you've, can, you've sent and then that person has uh, abused your trust and starts sending it to everyone. And that's what, peer, uh, that's what self generated harm is. And we're seeing more and more and more of this when it comes to uh, when it comes to the just the rise of the internet and social media and pressure on children to be part of the crowd and want to have all of the devices and everyone's on TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram or Messenger whatever it is you know it, it is an age old thing that children want to fit in particularly in that tween age years um, you know that you, you, I guess nine to twelve ish. Um, there's a lot of research as well that kind of talks about the influence of peers and the influence now of influencers. So children will watch something on TikTok, for example, and they'll hear an influencer say, you know, you're only cool if you have this jacket. Well, then everyone wants to have this jacket. And so if in the school that you're working in or at the camp that you're at, if children are saying, well, you're only cool if you share nude images or you're only cool if you're sexting or you're only cool if you're doing X, Y, and Z, I mean, that is what the trend is going to be. And so moving on, then we have our secondary prevention program that we're almost finished writing. It's it's written and it will be launched uh, later in this year. But this is for 13 to 18 year olds. Again, we're building from our early childhood to our prevention uh, primary to this one. And we are now in the, the primary school and the secondary. I have a lot more focus on digital safety, digital footprint, um, your etiquette when it comes to communicating with peers online. Um, and I'm sure many of you, if you're working with teenagers, you also understand that there is just this stress as well of wanting, like I said, to fit in, um, but also just knowing your worth and value. So we do the same. Um, we talk about um, human trafficking and exploitation and human rights. We talk about safe and unsafe migration, um, including false job opportunity, which we do in... Um, to a excuse me we do to a small extent in the primary age but we step it up in secondary because secondary age uh, kids between 13 and 18 or um, 17 you know might start to get part-time jobs they might be tempted with online um uh ads you know do you want to be a model do you want to be a famous um tiktok star do you want to be a singer and we've seen cases after case after case of children being lured by these false uh, job opportunities online. And there's a secrecy around it because they don't want someone else to steal their opportunity. Um, and so, again, we try and use it in an age appropriate way. It, it is play based as well. But because we're talking about teenagers, we actually make it cooler. So it's, you know, it's interactive activities and immersive learning all three of our programs and actually every program we do is immersive learning um so how can you get the child involved in the situation and that's why i was talking about what would you do scenarios i don't want to go into too much uh detail on things um because i want kaylee to have an opportunity as well to speak but um we also have uh storybooks and comic books we have them in multiple languages um they go to steps to staying safe is about 
tricky and trusted people. And what do you do as a younger kid if someone's trying to trick you? Um, staying safe online is about um, what I was talking about before, about the opportunities online, about those false job opportunities or those false um, opportunities to be famous. And and what do you do if someone's starting to compliment you online? And in essence, starting the grooming process. Um, but as a kid, again, if you're, and adults fall for this all the time as well, if you want a desire for a better life, you want fame in um, New York City or in London or something like that, and someone random on the internet jumps on and says, I love your video, you've got so much talent as a dancer or as a singer, you know, send us more videos. That is the the stepping stone into this grooming process for a lot of kids. And so we've got all these comic books. Um, we have uh, digital versions of these that will be coming out really, really soon. Um, so they're voiceovered, they're interactive. Um, and I, I'm, I think I said it at the beginning, but all of our resources are free. So these are things that you could talk to your children about online safety or about tr- trusted and tricky people. And then you jump on and you can have them walk through the comic books by themselves. Even younger children who can't read, they're, um, they're, or they're voiceovered. So they're able to listen to the audio. Um, we've got our safety guides. Um, again, it's like digital safety, a safe employment guide, safe relationship guides. These are amazing. If you're working with different age groups, you can go read them. You can print them off. You can run a session in your camps um, where you've read it, you run through it, you talk through it all, and then maybe every child can take away one of these guides when they go home. It could be a pack. It's like a, as you leave the camp you know, here is a pack that you take with you. So there's all these different things and they're all designed to equip um, you as camp counselors and camp leaders, as well as the children and parents and guardians. All of our resources have the hotline numbers too of the countries that you're in. And I don't know all of the countries that are represented on this call or who are watching, but we do have a lot and you can have a look on our website to see if your country is there. And if it's not, you can always reach out and we can see Um, what we can do but again these are designed to equip you um, and and whoever it is to look at the indicators like Kim spoke about look for the red flags and if you're seeing these then what call this number ask for help and there are so many amazing resources in all of these we have the end violence against children game this is actually a computer game Um, it was a UNICEF grant we outworked it in Thailand and Cambodia so if you have anyone from Thailand and Cambodia listening um, we have it in Thai, we have it in Khmer, but we also are really like literally this week in the process of getting the English voiceovers. And this is something that um, it talks through grooming and online safety. Um, and so this is something that uh, it is a free resource, but it is um, a facilitated resource. So in order to access this particular one, you'd have to reach out to us and we would do a training and get you set up with a license and then you can run it as much as you want. The idea for this with a lot of our programs as well is that we want to make sure that the facilitator feels equipped because like I said, children will self-identify. They will self-disclose. And the worst thing possible is for a child to come up to an adult and say, I think this is happening to me. And then the adult be like, no, you're fine. You're overreacting. That's not true. Or not know who to call because that might put a barrier up for a child going to seek help a second time. So we want to make sure that facilitators feel equipped. Um, And like I said right at the beginning, that doesn't mean that you have to go and investigate the trafficking situation yourself. It it could be equipped to know who to talk to next. And I'm sure that all your camps have protocols on child protection and, you know, who you would go and talk to um, in these situations. But this, again, is another resource that we have. I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee because I want to make sure she has time to speak about the different awareness programs. But like I said, um, all of our programs are free and we certainly, uh, if you have questions on anything I've just spoken about, would be more than happy to um, answer. But Kaylee, back to you. Hey guys. Um, Okay, I'm going to go through just a couple of things real quick so we can leave some time for questions at the end. Um, But first, I just want to start by saying this is super fun for me to get to be here today. Um, I used to work at summer camp when I was in college as a counselor. And so that wasn't too, too long ago. And so I really feel passionate about both camp and any human trafficking. So it's really cool to get to see the intersection here. Um, One of our really large awareness campaigns is called Can You See Me? So the videos that we played earlier showing the different types of trafficking are our Can You See Me videos. So 
the goal of those videos is really just to like show people what human trafficking looks like and equip regular people with the ability to see indicators and see what trafficking may look like in any situation. And so we try to highlight different forms of trafficking, different recruitment methods, and just really highlight all of those so we're not focused on just one type. Um, as you can see kind of listed here, we have Can You See Me in a bunch of different countries now. And so each of these countries, the scenarios were made specific to those countries and the cases that our offices have seen there. And so we try to make sure that we have a very like broad demographic and everything we're doing here and how we're representing it. And so I know that this is a global um, group. And so hopefully these will kind of hit all of those main areas and countries. Um, something specific to Can You See Me that I want to share just because I think it's a really great resource that would work really well for camps. Um, we have these things called indicator sheets. So this is one that I really want to share. It's got a lovely name. We call these our like bathroom stall indicator sheets, but they were essentially made to be hung up in like a bathroom stall or something like that so that like a child or something could see them. We use them in some school districts in the U.S., um, this one specifically that we've created so far is for online enticement, um, online exploitation, that video that we showed earlier. And so this is the child version. So it's kind of going through the story of what's happening and speaking kind of directly to the children of like, if this is you or you feel like this has happened to you. Um, it gives them some safety tips. It provides characteristics of a suspicious person, um, how to report if you do think it's happening to you. Um, and then this last is really just like images from the video. And so this is a really cool resource because it's made specifically, like I said, for children. So it's talking to them instead of just being like what we typically put out for adults or just really general. And so um, as Steph said, these are all free resources and um, we don't have them on our website yet, but I'm working to kind of get that all together. But in the meantime, I'm sure Kim, I can send it to her and she can send it to you all if you're interested. But these are really great. Um, we have some other variations as well of just like different scenarios, different types of trafficking, and um, that has just like a little bit about a type of trafficking. This is um, probably one of the better ones if it's talking about like a school and if you're, you know, this is the lover boy scenario. And so kind of talking about that and hopefully in a way that if a child or a student or a kid is reading it, they'll recognize and be like, oh, that sounds familiar. That, that might've happened to me. And so these are really great as well. This is more like a one page short version. So really good as well for like a bathroom stall or having it up on a board somewhere around the camp or something like that. Um, and then additionally, we have these as well. We call these more of like our storyboards. So it kind of shows more of the video and the story behind like what's happening with Can You See Me and some of those different indicators um, are listed as well with like the definition of that type of trafficking. So it's a little less personal, I would say for these um, and a little less speaking directly to them, but also a great resource. Nonetheless, um, so I'll stop sharing real quick. But those are our um, just some examples of our Can You See Me resources that I think would work really well in this camp. Um, what's our word? Camp area of just like posting it in bathroom stalls, on boards. You know, you have it in the cabins. Um, and so I think that's something that I think could be a really easy, practical way to get this in there and get this directly to the students. So another really massive awareness campaign we have is called Walk for Freedom, and so. Walk for Freedom is really just like a day long event that we do all over the world with different offices, different locations. And so this isn't necessarily something you can do at camp, but just wanted to kind of give you guys that information and let you know if you wanna to come to the event and be involved. There's walks, like I said, all over the world. If you wanna encourage students or parents to kind of go as well, it's a great day to just kind of learn a little bit more about trafficking and kind of start getting involved in the fight. Go through really quick our social media and just some other media we have. So we have these global broadcasts that we used to do yearly. And so each of them has a different theme. So there's identification that focuses on one, recruitment methods, and then another that's victim identification and hotline training. So these are like hour long videos that just go really step by step through a lot of these things and just give you really practical advice. And so I could see this being something that you can share with students or with campers. You could, you know, share it with staff, watch them yourselves. They're really, really great videos and super informative. Um, and those are online that we can share as well. And then other than that, we have a podcast called On the Front Lines that we typically use about once a year around Walk for Freedom to put out a podcast episode or two, just talking about, you know, maybe what we've been doing that year, types of trafficking, specific topics, all of that. And then obviously social media, if you want to follow us, we always love that. You can see like firsthand what we're doing when we have driver stories, rescues, all of those things happening get shared on our social media. And so it's a great way to kind of just see that um, and just really way, easy way to get involved. And then lastly, real quick, I'll touch on just a few of our education resources. So 
obviously this is a great place and Steph has kind of talked about this as well of reaching both kids and parents. And so a great way to do that is sharing these parent guides with the parents that come to camp and they're dropping off their kids or, you know, however you're interacting with them in that camp setting, these parent guides essentially teach them how to talk to their kids about trafficking and how to have those conversations. Um, so there's a parent guide that's for kids. So that's more focused on the ages six to 12 and then one for teens to kids ages 13 to 17. So we kind of gave those different ways. Um, and these are super awesome resources for parents. And we hear a lot that they love them and that it really helps them learn how to talk to their children about those topics. It is really hard and it's not necessarily something that's easy for them. Um, and then other than that, we have an educator safety guide. So if you know any teachers or you have any teachers that are parents or you yourself are a teacher, this is really great and kind of equips those people that are in schools with the students to be able to see and recognize trafficking and kind of understand what to do. So that was a very quick run through of all of that. I hope you got all that down. We could all probably talk about this for hours, um, but we can just leave these QR codes. They have some of our links to additional resources and ways to learn more up. Um, you can take a picture, scan them, whatever. Um, but leaving this last little bit open for questions, if anyone has any. Kelly, I saw a question about um, aftercare services for children. Do you want to do you want to address that uh, just real briefly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So our aftercare department, um, they really focus on a couple of different things. And I know we've kind of hit on it during multiple points of this video. Um, but the biggest thing probably is our child, child advocacy centers. And so Steph kind of mentioned those earlier, but that's where it's this place specifically for children to go. And they can work with people that are trained to understand in a survivor-specific way with all of those to talk to them and get them to share their stories. and help it and do it in a way that they can share it with these people one time in a really safe setting. And then that story doesn't have to be told over and over again by this child, just causing that trauma to be continually talked about. And so that's like a big thing that we do. Um, another thing is just even in our aftercare um, centers with our freedom centers and through drop-in day centers, um, they're open really to like all ages, essentially. Um, I know a lot of our even adult survivors have children or have had children after, anything like that. And so a lot of them have like children specific areas where kids can go. Um, same with like the child advocacy centers, we kind of take a few pieces from that and, and put it into our freedom center just to provide like a kid's room typically where, you know, if a survivor is bringing their kids, they have a place to play and a place to be safe. Um, but also we have a room, kind of the same room that a child can go and do that forensic interview and have, have that happen in a safe space that they only have to do it once. And so those are probably the biggest two that I would hit on, but Steph or Kim, if you have any other thoughts, feel free to add them. I just think it's important that we note that A21's um, approach is very um, holistic and community-based in our model for our aftercare services. So when we talk about a holistic approach, we think about the family unit as a whole. So when we have children that we're working with, whether it's at the child advocacy centers, which are specifically in Thailand or Cambodia, or the freedom centers that are around the world, including here in the U.S., um, we we want to heal the whole family, not just the victim. So um, children who are survivors, as well as adults who are survivors that have children are all included in the healing process. Oh, that's um, fantastic um, content that we all need to, to hear about. Um, it's fantastic in the sense that it's in depth and it brings us into awareness. It's It's terrible that it's true. And so the value that you brought today, we're so grateful for, because if it's a camp director or an association director, now, now we've got a better sense of, of what's going on out there in the world. And again, I know this is just scratching the surface, but enough to know that this is very much um, alive and, uh, and making its way to every end of the earth. It's going to impact the staff that we serve with it impacts the students that come through the campers and um you know you know camp is such a great fun experience and it, and it always will be but i think your story kim at the beginning is so appropriate to why this is applicable to us right now it's gonna it's it's already happening sadly but it's also going to happen that someone's going to bring it to an association leader's attention saying i'm a camp and we just found out about this what do i do or a camp leader um, scenario where they're just finding out about it like you did. And what, what do I do? What are my next steps? And so having this resource is so, so valuable 
um, having an organization we can just immediately turn to, um, points of contact. Let's say somebody uh, in the next two weeks, uh, God forbid, um, is approached by a situation like this and they remember this session, uh, who would they contact of the three of you or all? It's because they just want to say, where do I go from here? Right. So the human trafficking hotline is probably the best place for them to okay. um, to respond. Now, the question is, what country are they in? And mm. because you're an international organization, you would really need to look at the human trafficking hotline in your country. But obviously, if you have a question, you need immediate help. You can always reach out to contact at a21.org. Um, and we're happy to direct you if you need help locating that human trafficking hotline or the authorities in the area and who you would um, who you would contact. Steph, do you or Kaylee either one have anything addition to say about that? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Kim. Look at who the best contact is, whether it's a hotline number. If it's an emergency, obviously the police and local law enforcement. When it comes to um, online exploitation, sexting, sextortion, grooming, um, it, the name doesn't sound like it, but the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NECMEC, which is US-based, actually has a, a international um, reach. And so a lot of law enforcement um, agencies across the world will um, get tips from NECMEC or be able to give tips to NECMEC. And so they work collaboratively. There's also... Um, on their platform, something called Take It Down. So if you have kids that come up to you and say, like, I believe there are sexual images of me floating around, you obviously will talk to their guardian and, and, and you know, report as you need. But there's different ways of also going onto that website and um, getting intervention in that regard. So look, do some research on who who is in um, your organization, uh, sorry, in your country. Obviously, if it's a country that A21 work in, some of our offices run the national hotline number, so you're able to call us for human trafficking. Um, and, and we do have a hotline information for the countries we work in on our website. But I would say in an emergency, always call the police first. After that, assess whether it is trafficking, whether it's a different um, crime against a child, and your country should have the specific um, agencies best to deal with that. Hey, thank you. I want to be sensitive to our time. We just have a few minutes left. And so I want to thank you, Steph and Kim and Kaylee. So grateful for the work that you're doing in the world. Thank you for bringing us this content and awareness. Um, it will be watched many times over and it's going to be helpful to our membership. And I would say to those still on the call or who watch this later, you know, when we here in California didn't know what to do as a camp or should we even be involved, there, there are ways. Once you show that um, you have an interest in being a part of this solution, you can do that. Uh, one quick story is when the American football Super Bowl happens, that's a big deal in the United States. And um, and our weekend was pretty thin on housing, but hundreds of thousands of people would be coming into the San Francisco Bay Area for that um, Super Bowl that happened a few years back. Right. And so our facility was contacted and we opened up um, some of our accommodations for a group that was going to be rescuing. They're in the rescue part of that. Um, cycle and just took boys and girls out of the sex trade that were shipped in uh, just for that event and brought them out to a safe place at the camp where they can just um, be themselves in a, in a normal, safe um, experience with others. And it was a key part that a camp played in that. Um, and you can host events. We hosted conferences for years where the police and the government and social services um, all got together. And what did a camp have to offer? Again, hospitality and facilities. So they would hold this conference here and we helped them to get connected with local churches too. So it was, it was huge. There's things that we can do um, beyond just a one-on-one. -on -one. So just on that thought, um, I'm going to close out our time. We've hit the end of it. Uh, next Campfire Conversation, I think it's going to be in May and we're going to um, have John Pearson joining us. John, uh, was very much involved in Christian camping for years. In fact, he led CCI USA uh, from 1979 to 1990, and then also other um, Christian organizations like the Christian Leadership Alliance and the Willow Creek Community Church. Um, he was on the management team there. 
So this is specifically to a, a association um, leaders. Anyone's invited, but this is going to say, hey, there's five different ways to organize your CCI association. Which one are you? Because one size does not fit all. It's going to be a really powerful time and be on the lookout for that in May. So um, um, I'm just going to close this out because we're at the end of our time, but that was excellent. Uh, again, Kim Kaylee and Steph, thank you. And for those that were able to join us, thank you. And for those that are watching later, uh, please contact us if you need any more information on what we talked about today. So on that note, I'm just going to say, quick prayer. yeah, yeah, go ahead, Kim. Um, I just would just to make sure that the people who are recording it, if they don't have access to the chat, um, Steph just put in the uh, in the chat to make sure that you can download any free resources at a21.org forward slash education and yeah. all those resources available. So we want you to utilize what's available to you um, for your training and education purposes. So thank you for yeah. having us. We really appreciate you. Yeah, we're so grateful. So grateful. I'll just say a quick prayer. And we'll be well out of here. Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, our hearts are burdened by the, the realities that are out there. Um, but and may we find courage uh, to move forward, taking faithful steps forward, just knowing that building awareness and um, bringing whatever resources we have to the table, um, it all counts in this. I know it just, uh, it must be just horrific for you to see this going on with the people that you've created. Um, but thank you for the hope we have in Jesus and um, and those who are here, well, just feet on the ground and um, involved in this world of, of uh, rescuing and uh, restoring. Lord, we give it all to you. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day, and we'll be back in touch soon. Take care.